Hi, and welcome to PowerViews. I'm Dan McDade, your host and president of Point Clear. PowerViews is the show dedicated to finding solutions to the marketing and sales challenges we face today. I'm really pleased to have Jeff Ernst as my guest today. Jeff is with Forrester, and he joined Forrester after spending 20 years in sales and marketing. He's also the author of the book, The New Roles of Self-Enablement, co-author of How to Create a Killer Sales Playbooks, or How to Create Killer Sales Playbooks, and he's a regular contributor to B2B Magazine. He's also been featured by Forbes, CMO Network, Mashable, Huffington Post, NPR, Financial Times, Ad Week, and Reuters. Jeff, welcome to PowerViews. Thanks, Dan. Glad to be here today. I appreciate your allowing time for this. Hey, I've got in front of me an article that you wrote that's called B2B Demand Management Still Suffers from the Great Divide, but that will change. And it ties into my first question about alignment. But um, before I actually ask that question, or actually my first question is a more general question, but before I ask that, I just wanted to read a line from the article because I really enjoyed it. It says, well, now that we're in an election year, nothing seems to have improved and the polarization seems to intensify, have intensified. I actually thought when I first read that, you were only talking about the election, but you go on to say the ability of B2B marketing and sales teams to work together to create demand is still, well, very politically challenged. And um, I know based on your experience of working with CMOs and, and other leaders in, in marketing and sales, I'm sure, that you encounter a lot of different opinions about this. But I was wondering if we could start out with, you know, we know what didn't happen in 2011 from your article was that there was not, a, you know, an improvement in the alignment between marketing and sales. So um, what do you think is going to happen in 2012 in that regard? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, my perspective on this is based on a lot of inquiry calls and advisory work I do with our clients who are trying to figure out how can they be more relevant to sales? How can they be recognized as as useful yeah, and right. uh, contributors to the revenue engine of the company. And so one thing that I do see happening already is that companies are really making an effort to shift from an activity focus to more of an impact focus. So you know the old lines about how people are measuring butts and seats and email attendee lists, uh, you know, email subscription lists and things like that. And so they are going more towards looking at you know, what is the impact that we're having in terms of the, the, the leads that their marketing is contributing and what's happening with those leads further down the pipeline. And so I think because marketing is coming at it from that perspective, they're being forced to have more of that interaction with the sales organization, convincing sales that if you just let us help you, we can um, you know, help provide a steadier stream of uh, opportunities that you guys can be working. Yeah. <laughs> so I know it's wishful thinking, yeah. but uh, you know, I, I think that's why I wrote in that article, I, I think this is the year that it has to happen because it, we just can't continue to go the, where, the, where we have been, which is... You know, the, the sales guys just putting the knife between the teeth and going out and hunting and, and the marketing team just trying to get people on webinars and at their trade shows and without a connection to what actually happens to those people. Yeah, and I, unfortunately, I'm with you that I, um, I hope it happens and I feel like it has to happen, but um, I challenged an audience one time to find the oldest occurrence of an article that talked about alignment between marketing and sales, and so far the record is 1993, so <laughs> okay. this has been a and problem that's been around for yeah. a while. And if you look harder, you'll probably find them even earlier than that. That's right, yeah. I'll, we'll challenge this audience to do the same thing. Um, you know, it it's, wouldn't be a, a, a good discussion without talking about some of the new tools out there, those being marketing automation, social media, mobile marketing. And I know that you feel really strongly about mobile marketing um, and, and the increased uh, reliance on mobile marketing in 2012, but what, what kind of, um, what do you think is happening? Are, are these tools really working? Are they helping marketing and sales? Um, you know, how would you uh, kind of uh, characterize the state of the market from the standpoint of new tools? Sure. I would say it's marketing automation more than mobile marketing that I think is really ready to hit a tipping point with sales and marketing. And uh, so we do a lot of work with clients around marketing automation and a lot of survey work to understand where the state of adoption is. And, and I actually wrote a report or a prediction report earlier in the year about how I think it is going to hit a tipping point this year around companies adopting marketing automation. Um, just some of our survey work shows that 20% of companies are planning to implement 
marketing automation in 2012, and another 17% of companies are planning to expand or enhance their utilization of it. And so that, that's pretty substantial numbers. Yeah. I think there's a couple of reasons for it. Uh, one is I think companies have squeezed all the productivity gains they're going to get out of their SFA, mm -hmm. and, uh, and they're not reali realizing it didn't give them the gains they were hoping for, so now they're saying what comes next. And I think that's where marketing automation can fit in. I think it's because the price points are coming down with the intense competitive pressure and the competition between the vendors in this space, especially at the lower end of the market. And then I think there's just recognition of the, the nurturing model, the fact that you, you can't just go after those 5 or 10% of people that might be in an active buying cycle, but you need to nurture them until they are ready to buy. And, and you know, that's one of the things I think when you look at the dysfunction between sales and marketing, I, I think you know, marketing still needs to convince their sales counterparts of this whole value of nurturing and work with us. We, we're going to withhold the ones that aren't ready, but we're going to over time give you more that are worthy of the time of your reps. Yeah, I've got so, I've got in front of me here, and I, in fact, I might have gotten an early copy of this. Um, it was the B2B marketing trends and predictions for 2012, and one of the lines that I highlighted is in 2012, this is talking about CMOs, they will go from experimentation mode with new tools, devices, and channels to applying them to deliver real customer value. And uh, right. I think, I don't know if this article is available to the public, but it was a great article. Of, uh, if, um, is it available where folks can just read it, or is it? Uh, actually, it's, it's available to our Forrester clients. Okay, all right. <laughs> well, that, that's good for them. I'm sure that's great for the Forrester clients. Um, what do you what do you um, see, um, or what, what do you, what are your thoughts about the war that's raging out there right now about inbound versus outbound marketing? Um, you know, yep. so many times you see articles about. Um, in fact, I think you even talked about you know relatively poor results um, from outbound marketing or outbound calling, specifically. And um, uh, and and you hear companies say you know 70 percent of the buying process is complete before a sales rep even needs to get involved. What do you think? Is it a balance? Is it one or the other? How do you feel about that? Well, I, I think it's a balance, and but it really depends on how you define those two terms. And so I do think that companies need to make a bigger shift to what I call inbound marketing, and which which I think you know some of the vendors are calling inbound marketing, but. Just you know, putting more emphasis on getting your ideas out there into the marketplace and addressing the needs and questions that people have when they're in the very early stages of their problem-solving cycles, when they're first realizing they have a problem, they're trying to understand it, they're trying to decide whether to change the status quo in their organization. And that's when they're out there. They don't even have a solution in mind or who their providers might be, but they're out there searching for information. Our data shows they're on social networks looking for that information. They're talking to peers. And, and just trying to figure out how to solve that problem. And I think that's where marketers have the biggest opportunity now because that 70% of the buying cycle that might happen before they're ready to talk to sales, that could go on for many months right. or years. <laughs> of, uh, and, and a lot of companies could be churned if they're uh, slow to make change or, or change the status quo. But um, so I, I definitely think companies need to do a lot better with that, With uh, especially you know, content marketing is also becoming huge. We're seeing a lot of people talking about that. A lot of companies are calling me now asking, how do we do a better job with our content marketing and how do we scale our content production capabilities so that we can address those information needs that people have early in their buying cycle. So, and I do agree, you know, just to, to wrap up the point of the flip side of the outbound, I mean, I, I just, I'm not a believer, never have been in the interruption marketing <laughs> tactics of just buying lists and cold calling or emailing into them. So, but I think, um, you know, the, that's why I think a lot of the needs to be shifted away from that to more of this inbound. I think the problem with outbound is there's been an awful lot of mediocrity in, you know, really what has it been traditionally our space because, you know, we're pretty much of a proactive outbound company. But it's 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 warm outbound as opposed to cold right. outbound, and I think that yep. makes a big difference. The other thing I'd be interested in your comment on this, and um, it, we found this uh, with experiences with, with several of our clients, and that is that I have kind of this expression about marketing automation, and and don't get me wrong, we're big marketing automation fans, but the expression is not every senior executive wants to be treated like the human equivalent of a pinball, only getting your attention when they've hit the right bumpers and scored enough points. And uh, what we find is that the more senior level executives 
are much less responsive, so they're not really giving up their digital body language as our more junior executives and companies that are re relying entirely on marketing automation to score and to drive opportunities are finding that they're driving kind of smaller deals with lower level decision makers. So our sense is that there needs to be a balance. So do you do you feel that that's a, a valid point? or? <laughs> Oh, absolutely, and, and I think you, the key point you said is that warm outbound. Uh, I think that's just what's so important. It, it's the pure cold calling and and uh, you know buying the lists, the, the anonymous lists uh, that I just think is kind of the, the the part that is proving not to deliver the results that people are looking for. But I think if you can integrate, um, you know, if, if you look at the different stakeholders that are involved in a buying decision, you know, what you see is that uh, those those senior executives might be involved at the very beginning when they're kicking off a project, but then they're uh, asking people lower down in the organization to run with it, to do a lot of the research, and then they might come back in, the senior executives do, towards the end when it's time to, to narrow down the choices and make a decision and commit the budget. And so I, I think you know, a lot of what companies can do is, is uh, recognize that there are different influencers involved in a complex sale and make sure that they're addressing the needs with the content of those different people as they move through their particular journey. Sure. And I think companies that do that well are then uh, associating that or combining that with the outbound such that once you've got an inkling or you've got some of the digital body language maybe from some of the more junior people that you know that there's activity in there now and you've got your sales organization aware of that and they're understanding what the potential needs might be now they can you know use this more intelligent outbound to try to build a broader base of support within the team of decision makers in that company right and and they and I think marketing automation does help in terms of giving the sales reps the the context of what's already happened with that account and what are all the touches we've had with that account so that they can just be even slightly more intelligent right. when, when they have that outreach. Right. If you were to, um, you know, put on the, the marketing side or your marketing hat and then put on your sales hat and as you look forward into 2012, which is hard to believe for almost one quarter into 2012, this is generally when people start to panic about the year. Um, but you know, what are what are some thoughts that you would throw out in the way of advice for you know the marketing side of the house, and what what would you suggest for the sales side of the house for the rest of the year? Sure, I think for the the marketing side of the house, it's um, a couple things. One is I would um, I like to tell people, and I use this in a lot of the presentations I make. You know, take a stand. <laughs> Be provocative. <laughs> Don't be boring. I mean, I just think, especially in the technology marketing area, so much of what marketers are doing is, is just boring. <laughs> and, and so much of that just gets lost in the noise out there. And so especially with social media and the, the newer digital channels and trying to get people's attention out there, I, I think you need to be provocative. Take a stand on the important issues that are out there. And this ties into a lot of the work I've done around thought leadership marketing. And, and I think... Uh, you know, just about every company I have been tried to, you know, every company I work with, even when they first don't think that there's a role for being a thought leader in their market, once we really dig in and understand who has influence in their market and what their buyers are trying to do, we almost always find the, an opportunity to take much more of a, a thought leadership position on the issues that are out there and, and be provocative as you do it. I think one of the other things that I would recommend to the marketers is that the you know, social media is still the bright, shiny object that everybody's trying to figure out, and and you know, we talk about it, how it needs to go from cool to critical. And I think what I've seen is a lot of marketers, they're focused more on the media than they are on the social. They're, they're treating it as another outbound uh, channel to push their same old company and product messages out as opposed to looking at it as the uh, from the social perspective, which is that the, it's a way to connect to the people and uh, that might care about you, and they're connected to the people and things that they care about. And so, you know, and I'm writing a report about this right now, but I think, you know, B2B marketers need to do a much better job of not just random acts of, um, you know, social media and social marketing, but think about it more systematically such that the as you're getting these ideas out into the marketplace, make sure you're also injecting the calls to action that are going to draw people to uh, you know, do things where they're going to identify themselves or come to your web properties when the time is right. And 
So, you know, I think by making it more systematic as opposed to random, you can actually connect, and the technology is there to allow you to measure this connection, but you can connect the activities that you're doing directly to your uh, you know, revenue stream, your revenue pipeline. I think sometimes uh, people almost view it, and it seems kind of strange, but they almost view social media as anonymous. And, and I want to give you an example. There's a, a friend of mine here in town that runs something called Intrepid Radio. It's actually a pretty cool thing that he does. But um, Intrepid Radio and TV, as a matter of fact. But I was sitting with him one day, and I happened to get a tweet from somebody, and it was, uh, hey, I'm at Epcot Center. And I said, you know, I don't know if I want to really read tweets about somebody being at Epcot Center or what, the, what they had for breakfast or anything like that. And he said, you know, maybe you should think about this a little differently, Dan, because have you ever been to Epcot Center? And I said, well, hey, I was in Epcot Center just a couple weeks ago. And he said, did you do anything there that you thought was particularly fun? I said, well, it started pouring rain, so we went to the British pub and had a beer, and I thought that was pretty fun. And he said, well, you know, why don't you reach or reply to the tweet and say, hey, I was just at Epcot a couple weeks ago, and I stopped at the British pub and had a beer. You know, you should try it out. I had a great time. So now all of a sudden you've got a one-to-one -one connection with the individual as opposed to just, you know, kind of a generic right. association. And I really felt like I learned a great lesson with that. Well, yeah, and now just apply that to B2B marketing. It's the same thing. Right. I think what people need to realize is that, you know, a lot of marketers are taking sort of a campaign mentality towards social media. They'll think up these social campaigns and then they'll launch them and then it's done and then they'll go back and think of the next campaign. But social media is real time and so you need to be out there monitoring and listening to what's being said and what are the discussions about your product area, or your problem space and, and how can you get involved in those discussions in, in real time. And you know, and by doing it more systematically, you're now identifying the people that are, uh, you know, that, that are potential pro prospects or customers for you based on the, the things that they're talking about. And, you know, it's really interesting when you try to look at what somebody might tweet and decompose and think about what you learn from that. You know, let's say somebody's saying, hey, does anybody have advice out there for how to scale a, um, you know, XYZ type network where we're running into problems with, you know, <laughs> Again, I don't want to get too techy here, but you know. But now you can infer. Okay, this person's having a problem around scalability. They they have a need right now. They're probably being asked by their CIO to solve this, and and um, you know, chances are there might be an, a possible sales opportunity there. If I happen to be a so, virtualization company, I might want to get in touch, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and so I mean, the, the you know, depending and depending on how you know close that sounds to being sales ready, I mean, that might be one that gets routed right to, uh, you know, a sales contact to start to build a relationship with that person through social media, or the marketing people might want to just participate and share some information, again, not about the product, but about the you know, perspectives on solving the problem at that first, you know, connection. And, you know, as you get more and more people, you know, connecting with you and interested in your information, you know, they're now sharing it with the people that, that they uh you know, are connected to. So, you know, again, it, it sounds like all fun and happy to do, but it, you know, a lot of companies, I think, are just missing the boat because they're not looking at it systematically and, you know, trying to figure out or, or thinking about it as a social marketing engine that, you know, where they're monitoring what's going on, they're, they're developing and expanding their connections and nurturing those relationships and then also injecting in there the, the calls to action that are going to bring them into um, you know, learning more about your company when the time is right. Right. Well, we've uh, we've covered a lot of ground in a short period of time. What's um, what what have we missed? What else would you like to share with the audience today? <laughs> Ooh, great question. What have we missed? Um, well, uh, maybe the, the second half of the, your previous question was what advice to the sales teams. Right. Uh, maybe maybe just on that a little bit because that's always a good one. I think um, you know. I, I think the, to the sales teams, you know the. The marketers are all trying to be more relevant to sales. They're trying to hire more domain experts, experts in the customers and the markets they serve so that they can, you know, try to get out in, in front of sales or at least in a partnership state with sales. So I just encourage the sales teams to, to recognize, you know, they, they do want to help you, and you can't really do this alone. I mean, I mentioned in jest earlier about the sales teams that like to just put the knife between their teeth and go out and hunt. Well, I love that. So, I mean, maybe you need a few of those on your team, but if you really want to scale, you know, recognize that the marketing team is there to help you and, you know, share with them the, 
the insights and what those conversations sound like, especially early on when like those best sales reps are in there having a conversation with somebody and they just have this innate ability to ask the right questions that really understand where those people's heads are at. You know, what are they talking about? What are the challenges that they're having? What, are, what, you know, what, um, you know, what's that burning question that they need answered? Because if if they now work with marketing as partners on that, marketing can now help figure out. Okay, well, here's how we can address those needs more, you know, more programmatically, more more progressively to help uh, nurture these people along. So I think there's a lot of benefit to the sales organizations if they just sort of open up their mind and and not just look at the marketing team as the t-shirt and trade show people, but you know that they they are somebody that can really help you understand what these buyer journeys look like so that you can be more relevant and more compelling as is in the in the sales process. Yeah, I guess um, I have an expression that I use that it's no nobody ever built a statue to a committee. And I think what has to happen in a lot of companies, you know, not necessarily the IBMs of the world, but, you know, some of the mid, more mid-sized companies is that there really has to be a single person that gets a vision of how marketing and sales can and should work together and then really be relentless in pushing that agenda. I think that's what it takes. Oh, you're absolutely right. And that's why we see some companies that are adding these chief revenue officer roles, mm -hmm. which is the, that person managing both sales and marketing who's kind of wearing both hats and... And, or, and But I've also worked with several companies with a real progressive VP of sales that is playing that role, that, that's recognizing that they want to take a much more disciplined approach and build a, a much stronger sales process. And you know, just a good example of that is the Forrester sales team. I mean, very much a collaborative effort right now going on between sales and marketing to you know, up the game and uh, establish much more discipline and much more relevancy to the roles that we serve. Well, Jeff, I appreciate your time. How can the audience get in touch with you if they have a question that they want to ask? Sure. A couple of ways. On Twitter, I'm at Jeff Ernst, and you can always message me or uh, tweet me there. Or by email, I'm jernst at forrester.com. Probably the, the two best ways to get a hold of me. Okay. Well, great. And I hope everybody will go out and buy that book. I, I assume it's still available. The the new rules of sales enablement. <laughs> Actually, it's an ebook. It's available for free download. Just Google it. And uh, yeah. Okay. The free uh, ebook, the new rules of sales enablement. Well, Jeff, thanks again. This is Dan McDade with PowerViews signing off for now. Thanks for watching. <laughs>